the first time I saw Day for Night was on a United flight to Seattle, and we were sitting in first class, and it's like, whoa, Stephen, what are you doing? And you were off to Seattle for some reason, yeah, and he said, well, I've been working on this project. Here, take a look. And you handed me an, uh, an iPad or something um, uh, with, with this, this day for night uh, picture on it. And I'm thinking, Stephen, you're nuts. And, and you were talking about you get up and you spend, you know, 12 to 36 hours and, and you know, um, the, the, all the questions regarding, you know, how do you eat? How do you, you know, like astronauts, the how do you go question. to the bathroom? Uh, all those questions, and I'm looking at the pictures, and 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 I'm thinking, well, he's not going to be doing this for long. And lo and behold, that's not true. You've kept at it. So go ahead and talk a little bit, and then go ahead and and uh, do the screen share so that you can. Uh... Sure. So so day to night has been really now we're uh, uh, 11 years I've been doing this project, and uh, you know it started uh, in New York City, and um, I think it you know. Um, one of the things that uh, about it that's been uh, a joy is so i uh i i started to really think about how this came into my orbit in a way this this idea and um in a way for me it's um i've described it to people as i i sort of had this aha moment where all the things that i love about the medium of photography i managed to you know, basically condense into this concept called day to night, because it really is something uh, in which I get to um, do all the things that I love about the medium of photography, whether it's, uh, you know, shooting the street people, uh, shooting landscape, architecture, light, um, landscape, all those things are, are really wrapped into this concept. And um, what one of the things that, that people don't understand is really sort of um, where these the, the concept and the influences sort of were seeded. And for me, it was at a very young age. Um, I studied art history uh, when I was um, 14. I had a wonderful class. It was called Art Social Studies in high school. And I, uh, I'm still friendly and close to my art teacher, believe it or not, from high school. And uh, she brought me to and showed me certain artists. And one of them was Hieronymus Bosch, and the other was uh, Jan Bruegel. This is a, a famous painting called The Garden of Earthly Delights. And you'll look at the scale, but most importantly, it's the storytelling in these uh, paintings. So Bosch was um, before Bruegel, and uh, Bruegel was a big fan of Bosch's work. In fact, he would, in many of his paintings, he would pay homage to, to uh, Hieronymus Bosch. You can, I actually started, one of the things, I, as I got into photography, I would photograph details of Hieronymus Bosch paintings, and I would find the exact detail in uh, a Jan Bruegel painting. So uh, I, I knew they had this sort of deep connection. Uh, and this was my first trip to the Metropolitan Museum. I was 14, and I saw this painting called The Harvesters. And it changed my life because I never saw a landscape painting like this. But what I was drawn to was I, I was started to look at it, and I started to see that within the context of a large landscape, there was a narrative, a story going on, and I could almost feel the sweat of the brow of these workers in the field. And something else, you know, there were all these multitude of stories going on all the way in the background. There were kids playing on a field, hockey, and, um, and, and, and all this stuff was going on in one painting. And then in the foreground of the painting, it looked like the same guy who was working in the field was now breaking for lunch. And so I had the sense that almost time was changing uh, it, it, as Bruegel painted. I saw this at 14, like I said, and it had a profound effect on me. Um, at the same time, my dad had given me a poster that was a part of my room uh, growing up. It was something that I, uh, it was by this guy named Magritte, and it was uh, from the series of Les Lumiere series, where he would paint day and night together. Now, it's, what's really interesting was, I never really connected this, and somebody wrote me a letter and said, you know, was your work influenced by Magritte? Now, obviously, I'd heard about Magritte, but he sent me this picture, and when I realized, oh my God, that was the poster that was in my room, I had this sort of another intersection in terms of, of the things you get exposed to um, in the early part of your life, how those things sort of percolate and stay in your mind, and, and then ideas emerge from them. Um, the other artist that I was very heavily influenced by was Monet. And Monet did this series of, of painting time change uh, in the Cathedral of Rouen. And these paintings 
uh, as time changes and how the light and color changed, uh, your perception of, of this place were very profound to me that he was exploring this. He did the same thing in, with, uh, with uh, hay bales. Um, and, and those are things that I, I, I looked at uh, as a young uh, art uh, history student. I also studied uh, a guy named Albert Bierstadt, um, who of course was part of the Hudson River School. And when I started getting into this area, I realized that um, these guys were not just painting. The reason the light looks so magical in, in Hudson River School was because the light is actually moving in their paintings. And that's something I discovered and realized and began to explore in day to night. A Canaletto, uh, also one of my heroes in terms of just painting uh, perspective and scenes and storytelling. So the concept started in um, 1998. I had a, a project for Life Magazine where I photographed uh, Baz Luhrmann's film, Romeo and Juliet. And I had Claire Danes and Leonardo DiCaprio in the, uh, the photograph. And they asked me to do a gatefold, a, a four page gatefold. Uh, and I got to the set and it was a square. And so at the time, David Hockney was doing these photo collages. And so I thought to myself, wait a second, I could sort of inspired by Hockney, I said, instead of doing a panoramic, which doesn't work with a square, maybe I could take the square and open it. So I shot 250 single images of this cast and crew. And this picture was really paying homage to the 1940 photographs that were done called the big picture when they photographed everybody involved in the film. So here you see Leonardo, they're reflecting in a mirror. I asked them just for that one picture, if they could kiss. And when I pan my camera, so again, I shot 250 single images in the center. They're embracing. As I pan my camera, I see the reflection. I asked them for that one moment, please kiss. I come back and I put the thing together two weeks and I looked at it and I said, wow, this is really cool. I'm changing time in a photograph. And I never did that before. It was the, one, of the, one of those moments where you just go, that's crazy. But for me, doing this with, you know, by hand with 250 images was overwhelming. And then 16 years later, Photoshop was invented and I could do it seamlessly. And that's really where it came about. What I do is I, I change time based on what's called a time vector. So I decide where day begins and night ends, and that's called the time vector, as I mentioned. Now, my time vector can go on basically three axis points. It can go on the X point, like you're seeing here, day to night, left to right, right to left, or it can go on a Y axis, up and down, or it can go on a diagonal, which is the Z axis. And essentially, I'm exploring the space-time continuum within a still photograph. So when Einstein described time as a fabric that gets warped by a gravitational field, I take time, uh, the same concept of time, and I shoot it as a grid, except I take this grid and I flatten it into a two-dimensional photograph. So this is how I build the image. So it starts by creating the vector where I showed you days on the right, nights on the left, and then we create what I call a master plate. This takes about four months to do, to create a master plate based on time seamlessly. I try to build a master plate with as few elements as possible. And then I pick the best moments that I captured as they happened in time. And those moments get seamlessly blended into one single photograph. I'm really recreating my memory of the day as I saw it. On average, I do this with about 50 single images. So this was the first one I did. This was the High Line in New York City. This ran in New York Magazine. And you can see the scale, and it's really, I'm exploring the Bruegel scale. You know, I'm, you can see closely, you can walk up to my prints and see the stories and the details. And this was exciting for me because I started to begin to understand that, you know, one of the reasons I did this and the idea came about was because New York Magazine asked me to photograph, to do, create a really definitive photograph of the High Line. And so when I went and visited the High Line, I realized that when you stand on the High Line, you could at once recognize someone on a street corner, but you could also see people up in windows in their apartment buildings. It has a very unique scale. So one of the things I wanted to do was capture that scale. I convinced them to allow me to use a crane to do this picture. And as I was scouting, I realized that, boy, it's so cool at lunchtime with all the kids hanging out and eating um, and the traffic going through um, 10th Avenue, but it's really creepy at night. And I was literally on the phone with the uh, art, with the, the uh, excuse me, the photo editor. Um, and I, I said to her, what do you think about doing day to night, you know, um, south to north on the High Line? And she thought, oh my God, that'd be crazy. Can you do that? 
And I said, I don't know, I can try. And that's how it happened. That's literally how it began. So subsequently, the second one I did, also for New York Magazine, was um, they wanted something for Christmas, and I shot um, Washington Square Park. And then it, from that moment on, I showed this, that photograph in um, APAD in New York City at the big photography show. And I never had a reaction to any of my photographs like I had to that picture. And I started to really begin to explore this. This is, of course, the Flatiron Building on 9-11. This is uh, Times Square. And I started to really um, get into the concept of how I change time. In Times Square, I checkerboarded time. So you can see wherever there's shadow is actually night and wherever the sunlight is hitting is day. And this just gives you an idea of the kind of detail that goes on in my photographs. Like, you know, I'm working with very, very large files. It's like the highest resolution camera backs. Um, and the things that I'm doing in terms of the image quality for me, are really about creating a window into the way I see the world. So when you look at my prints in person, I want you to almost have a visceral experience like you're looking through a window. Central Park. This, of course, is the Brooklyn Bridge. I was in a crane for 18 hours doing this picture. Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And the, the fun part about this work is, is that as you look at this and you get close to my work and you see the stories going on, and the moments that I'm capturing as time changes. Oh, wow. I get to discover things too, because um, in this picture, as I started looking at my photograph, when it came in in the night side, I actually saw a family eating Thanksgiving dinner all together in that window. So- um, Such detail, you know, jeez. It's really, for me, um, it's been a unique experience. One that has informed me in a very deep and powerful way. The act of photographing today, you know, we are so distracted. We're so connected to the devices. Uh, when I photograph, I sit and they study a single place for anywhere from 12 to 36 hours. And when you do that, um, it's a form of meditation. And I think it's really the antithesis of what so much, uh, so much of what all of us are being bound to now is being held um, captive by our devices. For me, uh, the act of looking is uh, uh, this powerful gift. And, and that's what my celebration is in my work is, I, I like to say I'm a, you know, a, a ravenous collector of mag magical moments. You know, that's what I live for. I'm, I'm afraid of missing something. This is Rockefeller Center. This is of course um, Wrigley Field before they built the scoreboard in left field. This is what I call the sister image. This is of course Santa Monica Pier in LA. And this, of course, is uh, Barack Obama personally cleared me to photograph the 2003 inauguration. And uh, this was 10 hours of photographing. They allowed me to bring a scissor lift into and in front of the um, Washington Monument. And this is really what it looks like to have 800,000 people. And if you look closely, you can actually see time changing through the, uh, the television monitors. You see Michelle and the children waiting. The president comes down, he greets the crowd. He takes his oath, and that's probably the most famous line in his entire speech. And then I captured the motion and the energy that was so incredible about that day. What megapixel backs were you using? Do you remember? Because you, you're up, to, you're way up there in megapixels now. That's so. a, I believe that shot was done with a 75 or the 60. 60, yeah. Uh, gosh. You know, I'm now up to 150. Yep. Um, but these files are huge, you know. Some of my files are 20 gigs, you know, they're easy. Earlier, Stephen, you said that you sometimes these are like 50 to 60 images that you looked at. You you take more than that, or is it just 50 to 60 that you actually- Oh, no, at? I shoot on average about 12 to 2,200 images. Okay. I'll edit down to 50 or 60. The editing process alone takes me a month, just the editing process. So when you're editing, you've got to look at all the detail in every one of those images, and what do you do, circle them or- Exactly, I circle them. Yeah, I work. I work in Lightroom and um, and uh, you know and 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 I do some work in, in Capture One. And I have a whole system, a color coded system. And I work because of the way I shoot based on time. You know, I have very specific color code and num numerical codes that signify when I work with my retoucher on these are the specific moments based on this time. This is the person I want at this moment here, and everything gets laid in based on where they are in time. So it's a very um, precise um, thing that go, that in terms of the whole workflow. And that's been an evolution in itself over the 10, 11 years I've been so doing So you've got a ton of layers put together then, right? Oh, yeah, yeah huge. Hundreds oh, of layers. Yeah, yeah. 
it's an amazing uh, uh, epic kind of thing. I <laughs> yeah. say I, I'm blessed. I have a retoucher I've been working with almost, uh, gosh, almost 17 years now and uh, way before day to night. And so, you know, it's like we speak the same language and I, um, you know, um, I torture her. I can say that, um, <laughs> but, but in, a, in a good way, because the end result is, you know, um, I understand the language of retouching. And I, when I photograph, I think like a retoucher. So, so you're, I, you're thinking ahead of time and what? Yeah, gonna... exactly. You can't do this like and, and not have it like happen the way it happens and the way it looks unless you understand there's got to be a specific way it's photographed and then it can be executed a specific way in post. You, uh, one has to go hand in hand. These images are sort of an extreme example of what you talked about earlier, where the, the print is the original. I mean, yeah. you look at all the other images involved. The, you know, this is where it has all come together. Yeah, it all comes together. And, you know, this was, uh, this, this shot was a commission. The United States Embassy commissioned me to, as a gift to Canada uh, to, to create this photograph for Canada 150. And well, so um, it was pretty special. And it was uh, uh, hung in the um, um, National Museum of Art in Ottawa. And uh, I was there. And uh, I'm getting a private tour, literally, in the museum. and. Um, uh, the ambassador, or the wife of the ambassador comes over to me and she says, oh my God, Stephen, you will not believe who's here. He wants to see you. And it is, uh, you know, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, walks up, seeks me out, said, shakes my hand and says, you got to come down and meet my wife. We're looking at your photograph. Stephen, every single memory of my day with my wife, both of us, is inside your photograph. That's what he said to me. I look at this on your book and it's just, the, the detail and the, the ex exploration you can do of everybody in it, it's just a stunning, stunning image. Thank you. You, know, you. you can see, you know, Prince Charles is actually in, you can see him riding up, you see him get out, you see him greeted by, uh, by uh, you know, uh, the prime minister and his wife and the children. And then you see this, this very uh, beautiful ceremonial um, indigenous dance that they do. And, and all these things are going on in my picture. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm really telling the story we had, you know, it rained like hell that day it was crazy. And, uh, but then at sunset, the sun opened up and it was extraordinary kind of sky. And then of course the fireworks. So it was really, it was really special. Do you use a binoculars or anything when you're shooting this to see what's going on or when you're, yeah, I do. I do sometimes at this scale, I do use binoculars. I'm, I'm hunting always, but I, I'm, I'm kind of somewhat of a hawk, uh, naturally. Like I, just see things very, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm just locked in constantly. Like I said, I, my eye never rests. I never sleep. Uh, never. I, if I'm, <laughs> if I'm, if I'm meditating, even I have one eye open, you know, I'm just always looking, looking for a picture. Um, this was um, one of the interesting things about the work is I, uh, is, is the effect it's had on me in terms of the perception of color in conventional photography. So um, I'm a student of color, you know, um, obviously working with Jay and, 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 um, studying Albers and everything. Uh, but one of the things that Data Night uh, opened up was the idea of the color of light changing over time. And, and that really affects your perception. And for me, it has become actually a way, uh, it's, a, it's a mental cue to time is changing. The color of light becomes our cue that the day is changing, time is changing. And how many times have you gotten up early in the morning and you know, but just looking out the window, if the color of light is blue, you know you're up way too early, right? <laughs> and you know, if the sun is really hot outside, you know, oh my God, I've overslept. You know, it's those kinds of cues. Color of light affects your perception of time. So in this picture, you're seeing these red tulips. Uh, and again, when you see the red, that is the same color red. And what you're watching is the color of light effectively change the color of red. And um, you can actually see this in this picture. Um, as time changes, you can see the rotation of light through um, the tulips. And, and this is something for me that's been particularly exciting um, as a visual artist is seeing the effects of color change uh, and the way our brains adapt to that. You know, most people look at my work and they go, what is he doing with color? Like he's doing some crazy thing with color. And I'm really doing nothing with color. What I'm doing is the color of light is changing in my photographs. And that creates a perceptional problem for most people because our brains are wired. If we were all looking in a room together, standing here, and I had a red light on, after about 10 or 15 minutes, you, you wouldn't look pink and I wouldn't look pink. Our brains want to make that color neutral. 
And in my photographs, you can't go neutral because the color of light is changing so subtly. And that creates a, almost a, a form of similar contrast where it creates a dynamic sort of dance that your, your cones are going through when you look at my work. And that's what people comment. They go, what is he doing with color? He's doing something with color. This, of course, is um, I started to become passionate about history. And, uh, you know, the, the three themes that are about my work really um, from the beginning is, uh, I, of course, you know, the, the, the fact that uh, I'm drawn by time, right? I'm fascinated by time. I'm fascinated by, by history. And I'm fascinated by memory. And those are the three core themes that are very much a part of Day to Night. Um, and so I went to, um, to photograph Stonehenge and uh, was blessed to, you know, capture it um, in, in a unique way. What, one of the things that's incredible is you'll notice there are people actually in Stonehenge uh, in this photograph. That only happens like once a year. It turns out they allow a pagan wedding to take place. And the day I happen to be photographing, it turns out, is the day they have the pagan wedding. Which like is, I said, you have an angel riding on your shoulder. <laughs> that's, that's definitely an angel. So um, Venice. I wanted to go back in time and photograph a place that isn't truly timeless. And so I went to Venice. Uh, Canaletto was my scout for this series. The historical regatta looks very much the same as it did uh, in 1496. I mean, you know, again, th this is, gives you an idea of just some of the details in my work that uh, you get to explore when you walk in. It, and, and when I say walk in, I really like you to walk into my prints. I, I, don't, I don't want you to stop at five feet and just say, that's it. I want you to come in and take a deep, deep look at what, what, what we're doing, what, what's, what's happening within this world. And I like to I like to call that an immersive image where you know you stand for back and you just keep walking closer and closer and closer and yeah I mean you know what amazing things that, that happens my galleries tell me this you know most shows you go up and people walk in and they walk around they're in and out like within 15 20 minutes people spend like 20 minutes just on one of my pictures they'll just like stand and look into it and uh, this was of course um, Easter Mass uh, in the Vatican this took me about three years to clear and I call it my Where's Waldo of Pope Francis. So he actually appears in this photograph 10 times. And I, I only counted six. No, there are 10 of them in there. Yeah. And uh, I, Ted, uh, you know, had him as a special guest speaker. And I had done my TED talk uh, in 2016. And the curator, Ted, uh, I know very well. He's become a friend. He called me up and he knew I wanted to do this picture and he was trying to actually help me. Ended up by a fluke, I got contacted by a priest in the Vatican who loves my work and wanted to use my picture of uh, uh, Paris Eiffel Tower in a book. And so I wrote him a note and I said, sure, you can use my photograph, just give me name credit, and maybe you could help me. I'm trying to do a day to night of Easter Mass. And this priest literally ran it up the ladder, got me permission, got me this location to shoot from. And long story short, I, uh, uh, I, I, I do the photograph and, um, uh, before I did this picture, I, uh, I, I, I always go to museums, and I went to the Vatican Museum, and it turns out there's only one image of the Vatican in the Vatican Museum. It's a drawing that was done like 300 years ago, and it's exactly from this view. So I knew I had the right view um, when I did this picture, uh, but it was uh, an amazing experience doing this photograph uh, and capturing this day. You have rooftops in that picture. Were you on a crane or were you on a building on this one? I was on a building. I was in a, and actually it's, it's one of the, it's owned by the Vatican. It's where the nuns are, are, are they, the nuns in training live. And so they allowed me to stay there. They had three rooms, additional bedrooms that they allowed me to rent. So I was there for, you know, three days, you know, it was fantastic. I could set my camera up. It was luxury. I actually had a bathroom. You know, it was really, <laughs> it's, it's as good as it gets for a day to night. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, this, of course, is Paris, uh, uh, Notre Dame and, and the Tournelle Bridge. Um, I, I, when I shot this picture, I never thought that our history would change so much from when I made this photograph. Uh, and my hope and prayer is, is that, you know, this, this magical place, uh, Notre Dame, returns to its glory. Um, one of the things you notice in this picture is how alive and dimensional it is. And what you're seeing is I actually use the, the natural light from the tourist boats to paint light across uh, the, uh, Notre Dame. So that is actually the reason it's lit like this is because I'm taking multiple exposures and actually naturally painting with light. That's kind of cheating. 
No, it isn't. It's all based on time. So just to give you an idea, <laughs> that <laughs> that picture to, to get – to capture just to give you an idea it's a 30 second exposure i was shooting with a back those days that only could shoot 30 seconds that was maximum length of time so you can imagine how hard that was to capture that much night in one photograph tour de france um this was a, an amazing thing to watch and in this photograph you actually if you go from the right side time changes diagonally so you see early morning people like to ride on the champs Elysees before the race now you see the women's race starting at about 10. And then if you look at the Arche Triomphe, you can see the light rotate through it. And in the middle, you actually see the parade that goes on midday. And then on the left side, you see the afternoon. You see the F-16 flyover. That's the beginning of the, uh, the, the men's race. And you can actually see the yellow jersey in the photograph. And on the far left-hand corner of that image, you actually see a, a TV screen. That's the moment that the, uh, the guy crosses the finish line uh, for the, the winning the, that phase of the tour. Holy cow. So it's the whole race in one picture. This is, uh, of course, uh, I started to photograph religious festivals. I went to Harimwar in India, where you have hundreds of thousands of people come to pray in the Ganges the entire day. This is a detail. That moment, that guy, what, he said, what they claim is, you let yourself go to God. You know, you just float and you dive into the water. Um, really an extraordinary thing to witness. I photographed from a police tower for about 18 hours during this picture. This is China and Vietnam. Uh, it's a place called Di Chen Falls. I found this location, believe it or not, on the internet. I thought somebody photoshopped waterfalls into the Guilin Mountains. I didn't believe it was real. And then I found out it was real. And I was determined to go there because to me, it's like Shangri-La. One of the things is people always say, gosh, you know, you always have brides in. Do you bring the brides in? And I said, no, nah, I don't bring the brides in. And there enough, there's a bride and groom in my picture. And it's, it's always amazing because I photograph such sort of iconic places, places that everybody wants to get married or have pictures taken. And inevitably, I always get a bride in a picture. <laughs> Rio de Janeiro. This is probably the most complicated and rich storytelling photograph that I've ever done. This is, of course, the Palio in Siena, Italy. Uh, one of the great events, uh, I, I describe it to people as, if you think the World Cup is intense, um, it, you know, the Palio makes the World Cup look like a Disney movie. I mean, these people are as passionate. Uh, you're talking about centuries of, of you know, competition and, and uh, sometimes very bad feelings <laughs> that, that, that linger. And so uh, if you look to the left of the photograph, you see that's uh, at night, the sun rises over uh, the, the buildings. And then you see there's uh, the horses. They walk them out in the early morning uh, to get a feel for the track. You see on, uh, by the clock tower, they actually have a, a 11 o'clock mass. And then the beginning of the parade starts. And then you see the actual race start on the far right here. That's a false start. And then as you pan more to the right, that's the actual official start. And then on the far right, you see the horse crossing the finish line. That's the minute he has won the Palio. And on the far right side of this photograph, you see the Contrada going absolutely berserk as they are celebrating the winning of the Palio. So it's all of the entire day, 18 hours. I waited 90 seconds to finish my photograph. So in 90 seconds, I spent 18 hours and I had to capture this race in 90 seconds and not miss it. So um, there's a lot of pressure when you do these things. I mean, there's a... a you know, it brings all of, you know, uh, you know, my, my beginnings as a, as a, a you know, a photojournalist, as a sports photographer, all that stuff. You, you can see how I'm translating that into this work. That, that city is probably one of the, the coolest cities to visit no matter what. Just you could spend six hours on that square and it just changes yeah. even in small ways in front of you, not to mention the horse race and the rest of the city. I do when I do my uh, Tuscany tours, we we spend a day there and literally you can get there in the morning and wait till the sun goes down and not do a picture like this, but see so much stuff. It's one of the coolest places I, I imagine. I've had memorable afternoons in that It, it is a magical place. It's a real magical place. I had a wonderful, I'll tell a quick story. I, I, I showed this in a gallery and a, a gentleman walks up to me and he says, could you please share this? This is the most incredible narrative story photograph I've ever seen. And I, I start describing the story as I just spoke about it with you guys. And his wife keeps elbowing him. 
And I said, you know, I was inspired by this really great documentary called uh, uh, The Palio. And his wife is now elbowing him really hard in the chest. And he goes, honey, she says, would you please tell him? He goes, uh, I actually was the director of that film. I go, get out of here. He goes, let me tell you, Stephen, you got it so dead perfect. It's crazy. I said, I got to tell you, man, I learned so much from your movie. Your movie was so insightful and really opened my eyes to all of what was going on behind the scenes in the palio. And that's something that I really try to do in my work. I try to deep dive in anything that I photograph because I find through that, I, I, I have um, uh, subconsciously or consciously, I inject those narratives within this photograph. You know, if you know what you're looking at, you're going to find it here. You know, that's what I really try to do. Yeah, this is just amazing. So then National Geographic got behind my work and they um, gave me a grant to document the national parks. I pitched them on the idea of, of actually, you know, to paying uh, homage to uh, the great, like Carlton Watkins and, and, um, and, 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 and so many of the great Ansel Adams, the great mass photographers who documented the parks in a unique way. I said, allow me to go to the national parks and capture them in day to night, show them in a way that nobody's ever seen them before. And so I went out and I, they, they were hesitant. They didn't think they, they could, you know, they really weren't sure. So I said, okay, I'll go out and create one. And I did this one first, Yosemite. And I did this photograph and I, um, I sent it, uh, emailed it to the photo editor. Um, and she sent me an email back. Oh my God, how do we get in on this? And, um, subsequently I got a grant from the society and I created a whole series on the national parks based on this concept. And this is photographing for 36 hours from a cliff, uh, literally I'm above what they call the tunnel view, the actual tunnel. And I captured all these moments as time changed. That's the moonlight over El Capitan. Those are the stars moving. You can see a rainbow in the waterfall. I mean, these are all things that just happened. Um, and I was inspired, you saw early on by Albert Bierstadt. I was, I swear to God, I was channeling Ansel Adams when I was doing this picture, I was thinking about him. Um, and you know, so many great photographers, so many masters um, uh, who I've just studied and really worshiped my whole life, um, shot this view. This is probably the most photographed view or painted view in, in, in history uh, in America for sure. And so it is a humbling experience when you're there and you witness it in person. And, you know, you, you, you're able to, you know, uh, see it in a way that, you know, maybe somebody hasn't seen it before. So it was, a, it was an incredible experience to, to, to witness. Kevin and I were together. I was thinking about you, Stephen, when uh, we were there at sunrise and we were right about where that woman is throwing the kid up in the air. Ah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, we, I got a, a nice shot, but it's, it's not, it's not your day to night. I, I love this shot. It's a kind of, yeah, no, I'm, 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 I mean, we scouted this and I had to get special permission to be up there. I had to be tethered on ropes. That's how complicated this was. If I made one false slip, I would have slid straight down camera and everything. It was so unstable. I can't even begin to tell you what I was on. I mean, I remember my hip hurt me for about two weeks afterwards because I was basically standing for 36 hours on a 45 degree angle. Um, and, and that's what it took to create this photograph. You know, it's, um, then they, they sent me to Yosemite. Uh, I got special permission to go to the uh, crow's nest of the, uh, the, the old uh, Yellowstone Inn, you know, that uh, famous hotel. Uh, and so I was able to make this picture. Again, 36 hours um, on a full moon rise. Um, so, you know, a lot of these pictures, I really time things. Like I, I try to get there when the weather's right. It's got to be perfect, not too windy. And hopefully I've got a full moon because when you're shooting at night, you know, um, how do you light up the night sky unless you have, you know, a bright full moon? Uh, then I had to try to capture um, the cherry blossoms. And this was probably one of the most challenging of all of them. Uh, I was in a crane for 18 hours. You could, you know, plan your entire trip, forget about photographing, and miss the cherry blossoms. So the, the ability to be able to show up there and capture this um, and actually the crane company show up, drop it off, get it up in the air, make sure the winds weren't too bad, and actually make this picture. It was a minor miracle, really, to get this shot. Was that Marine One? Yeah, it was, actually. It was pretty crazy. Uh, and then we have this one, which is, of course, um, the Grand Canyon. And I'll, I'll just show you a loop view of this because it's, it's, it's pretty stunning. But I think this one really begins to um, show the exploration of light and the way time moves through my pictures. 
and the way um, I use light to create almost a three-dimensional effect in my work. And these are all the details. These are just moments that I captured, single moments. And you can actually see uh, there's a lightning bolt, the rain, and that whole left side is actually moonlight. That's all moonlight on that picture. So this was 36 hours. And, you know, to do a one-hour exposure in moonlight, and then you have to wait an hour for it to come up. And if a cloud goes up, you know, in between your exposure, you're, you're dead. So there, you can see just how many variations there are um, in terms of what I do and all the things that have to break right. So then I went to the Serengeti, and this is where my work really is pivoted. I started to begin to photograph wildlife. And my, my focus now is really on endangered species and habitats. That's what my, my work has become. And this was scouting for my first day to night in Africa. I found a watering hole. It was during a five week drought and all the animals were gathering. I spent about three days studying this watering hole and felt pretty confident. I got special permission from the park to set up my rig. So we built the scaffolding off of a truck. We actually stayed in the park overnight, which is unheard of. They never let you do that, but they granted me permission. And then uh, what I witnessed was really transformative. This is the photograph. Um, uh, this is 26 hours uh, of photographing from that blind. And time changes diagonally on a z-axis. So morning is on the far right corner and time moves diagonally through this picture. And people always say to me, come on, were there that many animals? I have pictures, single frames, where you can't see water. That's how many animals are in this picture. Uh, out of curiosity, you know, you always kind of pick different corners or different areas to work from left to right or right to left, corner to corner. How do you determine ahead of time that it's one that you'd like to actually do or you know, because once you do it, you have to live with it. I mean, that's... Yeah, that's very true. And, and that's part of what I do. So what I do is there's some places I have an idea. Okay, I think day's going to be here, night's going to be there. But I always, even though I have maybe an idea, I don't live in a closed space. I stay open. So, and staying open means that those elephants coming across at like, you know, uh, 5.30 in the afternoon or whatever it was, it's, it's a, at, you can see their backlit. And then the sun setting behind that tree like that, and then the stars coming up on the on that diagonal, you can see how time moves through this photograph. You see the front light, the early morning light. You can see as the zebras get top lit, you see the zebras get back lit. This is all happening, you know? And so um, when I'm given a certain gift, like that group of elephants was one of the most extraordinary single moments I've ever seen. I mean, that's a single moment in my picture. It's a moment that I almost missed. Um, in the early days, uh, I, I, I would have to back up my computer every three hours because I have so much information. So that meant we have to stop shooting. I disconnect. And so for that five minutes of backup time, I used to literally become hysterical. Like I, I was so afraid I'm going to miss something, like a kill would happen or something's going to happen with my picture. My assistant at four and a half minutes goes, okay, Stephen, you're live. And at that moment, nothing had been going on. It was very quiet. Um, and all of a sudden, I lean my head out of the blind and literally is that family of elephants and they are marching like the jungle book. They're coming right through the picture. And I'm just bang, 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 bang. I'm telling you, if he's 30 seconds longer with that backup, I never catch this moment. So those are some of the things that happen. But a lot of times, to answer your question, Kevin, I really reflect on what the day was, what my memory did, the best moments, and I will base it on how, do, what was the narrative like in the morning? What was the narrative in, in and I shoot a time lapse. I actually will run a 35 millimeter camera system just as a study guide oh, to wow. um, show myself seeing how time moves, how light moves through a picture. And that really helps me in the process of creating these images. Serendipity on the um, uh, Serengeti. Yeah. Oh, it sure was. It was a highlight. So that really moved me into the space of, of thinking about creating a narrative, a story. And really, I was interested in animal communication. So um, when I gave my TED Talk in 2016, a guy came up to me, he says, you should come and do a day to night where I work. And I go, where do you work? He says, in a place called Ropes and Bite. It's the only place in the world that orca whales, families of them come in for what's essentially a spa treatment. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, they sound and they rub the barnacles off these rocks and the rocks only exist in the bite. 
I said, well, what else is there? He says, well, you got bald eagles, you got all kinds of wildlife, you've got cruise ship, you've got kayakers, you've got sailboats, you've got fishing boats. I go, wait a second, everything coexists? He goes, yeah, it's kind of a magical place. And so I uh, stayed in touch with him and I said, I want to come out and do a picture. And this was the photograph, 36 hours on a rock outcropping, making this photograph. And um, it was transformative. Um, I actually had a microphone from the scientists. Um, the group is called Cetus, and they, um, they are actually, they protect this area um, from people who maybe get too close to the whales. Um, so they have little speed boats and they just give you nice warnings. By the way, please stay at a certain distance. You know, you're welcome to watch the whales, and, but you must maintain a certain distance. And um, they uh, gave me access, they gave me a, a microphone, uh, and they, mic uh, they have underwater microphones so they can hear the orcas and study them. So I could hear them coming in, uh, which was kind of an astounding thing to be able to do as you're photographing, you know, to know your subject. And one of my favorite moments was, you can see off in the distance, there's a huge uh, uh, blowhole that's coming up. That's not an orca, that's actually a humpback. And before that humpback surfaced, I heard him sing. Uh, in the microphone and he sounded like Pavarotti compared to the orcas much different sound you know like hugely different sound and uh, as soon as I heard it I was like wow what's that and then I was ready on the camera and sure enough he came up and uh, and he blew that steam out of his blow home so um, National Geographic gave me a grant to document bird migration day to night so this was uh, I had to go to one of the furthest southernmost points in the world it's in the Falkland Islands it's called Steeple Jason I tell you, honestly, probably maybe about 50 people have ever set foot on this island. It's really remote. And you, it's owned by a WCS. And so they only allow scientists out and, and very large donors. Um, they have one house on the island and one 1971 uh, Jeep, uh, excuse me, uh, Range Rover. And um, I uh, spent 11 days on the island. Uh, I had to scout it. I had no map. Uh, but I was looking for a specific nesting area that these black-browed albatrosses um, live in. And it's the largest nesting area in the world for these birds. You had to hike through almost uh, six foot to eight foot high tussock. Uh, I was doing this with eight cases of equipment to get this finally, this view. I stood on top of the, a dry tussock. I didn't have a ladder or a scaffolding. And I found an amazing location. Uh, these birds are incredible. They're just the most nurturing, loving birds. Um, the, Babies you don't want to get too close to because they have this habit of projectile vomiting. And um, here's my view. This is the angle I was shooting from. I spent 36 hours here doing this picture. Um, I witnessed some just extraordinary things. Uh, we had in the morning an incredible rainbow happened. And there it is. My assistant filmed it with his iPhone. Because people always look at my pictures and they go, oh, that rainbow really didn't happen. Did it like that? And I go, no, it did happen. Of course, the downside of seeing a rainbow like that is it does rain right afterwards. But this is the scene. It was an amazing, staggeringly beautiful place. And this was the picture I made. Oh. So this is 36 hours. Time changes uh, from right to left. Uh, you're seeing the rainbow in the morning. And what you get to witness in my pictures is really um, – you get to see the communication of a species. You see um, the, the sort of mating ritual, the way uh, they communicate, the way a mother teaches a baby how to fly. Uh, all of these things are the things I witness over a 36-hour period. So in many ways, I'm, I'm sort of like a scientist, uh, but I'm telling it uh, in, in a very visual narrative way of what I'm, I'm bearing witness to. And it's really been inspiring to... Um, to learn about these birds. You know, I wasn't a birder before I did this series, but I'm totally a birder now. Um, this is another one I did uh, in um, a place called Rose Sanctuary, which is in Nebraska. And this was, uh, I was photographing what, in my opinion, is one of the greatest things you could ever see. And that is the Sandhill uh, Sand Crane migration. I built a scaffolding. This was almost uh, 20 feet up in the air. I spent 36 hours in this scaffolding photographing. Um, you cannot turn on a white light. You cannot sneeze. You can't do anything. The birds will leave. That's how spookable they are. So here I am. This is what my setup looked like. And again, you know, um, this is really difficult stuff because uh, you can see I'm using a red light there because 
uh, white light really freaks them out. I'm very, very close. The Audubon Society uh, actually gave me permission to build this. I built the scaffolding, by the way, two weeks before the birds actually came in. So when they landed, they were used to my, uh, my blind being there. And you get to see me doing this, this work over time, which is pretty crazy. The long lens shots, that you're, you've got somebody there with a long lens. Are you shooting all, th all the cameras or do you? I shoot all the cameras. You can see I'm, I'm a voracious photographer. So if, I, if I'm not doing my day to night and I see something like doing a long lens sun uh, of a shot of the sun setting with birds going through it, yeah, I'll take out my 800, I'll shoot a few frames. I, I give my, my, my assistants stomach aches because I bring like major systems not just one system, I'll usually carry three or four camera systems, you know? So imagine fitting all of that stuff into a four by eight space and having to sleep in it for 36 hours. Much less doing everything else, holy right. cow. And then this is the photograph. Oh. So this is probably the most complicated day to night in terms of layers. We're probably over 200 layers here. Um, but what you see is really what it looks like and what it feels like when you, you're there. So you can see on the right side, those are all the, the, the sandhill cranes are sleeping. You can see them. Now they get up and they go out in the fields in the morning to roost. And then as time changes, they begin to come back into the evening. Oh, look at that. They're opposing each other. Wow. Yeah. And I did that because when you're physically there seeing this, Kevin, it literally is like this. Your eyes and the sky literally look like fabric undulating. You cannot believe what this looks like in real life. I mean, my photograph, I feel, really captures the epic quality of this. When you see a large print especially, these birds are eight-foot wingspans. Just imagine that, each one. So imagine the scale of this thing. Um, National Geographic did an exhibition of this work, and I made a 12-foot print, three panels of this photograph. So they're almost life-size. And it really is, you know, it transforms you when you stand there and look at it. But for me... You know, I've seen a lot of incredible things in my lifetime. When I saw a sunrise here at, at, at this moment, when they started taking off and the sky was turning color, I, at a certain point, my mouth was agape and I couldn't photograph. I actually was overwhelmed visually to the point where I was frozen. And then I sort of had to say, schmuck, start taking pictures. Come on, you know, you got <laughs> to photograph this thing. And that's what I did. I started taking pictures. But there are a few things that literally um, freeze you because the beauty is you're in such awe of what you're witnessing with your eyes. Mm. And then I went to a place called Bass Rock. Uh, this is what it looked like. I spent 36 hours on this. I must say, it's a, a wonderful place to visit for a few hours. I don't recommend sleeping there for 36 hours. I am, quite frankly, in the nests uh, of these um, northern gannets. This is a very remote island uh, off of the coast of Edinburgh. And what you're seeing, this is the image. I spent 36 hours on this volcanic rock. Um, to say the guano was being dropped on me is, uh, is an understatement. It took two days to clean off my gear from the guano attacks. Um, these are very aggressive birds, uh, but they are beautiful. Uh, and You probably still have that smell in your brain, right? Oh, I, I do. I do. It never leaves you. And my eyes are already tearing just thinking about it. Yeah, when Kevin and I went down to Antarctica, we smelled the land before we actually saw it because of the smell of penguin guano. Oh, yeah. It's like that. It's that pungent, you know. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's a remarkable place. It's owned by one family still. Uh, and they gave me permission to spend the night there. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, it, it's, it's, it is an amazing place. It's, uh, there's no question about it. I've... I've like I said, th this whole experience with the birds uh, really was fantastic. So then I uh, went to Lake Begoria, and, and that was uh, really uh, um, something that well, I'll never forget. I was going to photograph lesser flamingos, and I had planned actually to go, believe it or not, to Rio Largatos in Mexico, because there's a fantastic area where they nest. And I had it all cleared. I'd spent eight months preparing. And for the first time ever, the lesser flamingos never came to nest in, in Rio Largatos. So suddenly my shoot was off. And we, uh, I got working with my wonderful editor, Kathy Moran at the Geographic. She, um, we started having conversations. I go, Kathy, we gotta get flamingos. She goes, well, you know what, Stephen, Africa, I've heard about Lake Begoria. And I had heard about Lake Begoria, but I knew they don't nest there. So I, they might have a lot of birds, but shooting non-nesting birds day to night is a real challenge. But we found out that they had not just a few birds, but 
thousands upon thousands. So we went for it. We went to Lake Begoria. Um, this was the scout. We drove in. Uh, it's, a, it's about a, a five hour drive from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, I got there and I found this spot. And notice there are puddles on the ground. There was a lot of rain every night. And uh, I do my homework. Uh, we're building a scaffolding now. It turns out that uh, lesser flamingos love eating in this very diatomaceous volcanic water, but they love bathing in fresh water. And it turns out as I was building and looking for locations, I noticed they all would come out in the morning and they loved bathing in this freshwater stream after the rains would come. And we're shooting in the dead of dry season, so there shouldn't even be rain on the ground. But of course, with climate change, they were getting massive floods every night at, at 930 at night. So in this instant, climate change really worked in my favor. And I was able to photograph these birds because of the flooding. Uh, the birds stayed in the same place. They basically ignored me. I built my scaffolding right on the edge of the flood zone. So this is 36 hours uh, within this blind. Um, and you can see where I am in this film. And it was just, I mean, remarkable experience because what I get to learn when I do these things is I get to see um, things that most people never see. So these are the lesser flamingos and time changes on the y-axis here, right? So the bottom of the picture is day and time goes through the picture vertically. And one of the things you're going to notice in this picture is you're going to see the way the spacing and the color of light changes on the flamingos. So early in the morning in this area, you're going to see this is when all the birds actually flew. That's one single moment. And the reason that moment happened is I witnessed the marabou storks, which are the natural predator to the lesser flamingos. There they are. They, are, uh, they were hunting these birds every hour on the hour. And so they had a massive attack at 530, right towards sunset. And so I was able to get one single moment that you see in the background. And that really established how I wanted to change time in this picture. I knew because of that moment, I had to have that moment in the picture. And so I decided day would be at the bottom and I would change time diagonally. And people look at this picture and they go, well, how did you do that? How did you change time with all the birds? Well, the, the, guess what? Those, um, those marabou storks, Every hour on the hour, they would attack the flamingos. So they essentially created a clean plate for me every hour. And that enabled us to seamlessly blend all these various times a day with the birds. So thank you, marabou storks. Uh, this, again, uh, uh, this was a proof of concept to a new project I'm doing for the geographic. Uh, I'm doing a documenting endangered species and habitats in Canada now. These are, of course, the grizzly bears. Uh, I spent 36 hours. Um, in a place called Bella Coola, photographing these bears. Uh, and had one come very close to me, as a matter of fact, about five feet away from me. Uh, and let me recommend that if you want to see a bear come close to you, I recommend sucking on a honey eucalyptus um, ricola lozenge. They particularly are fond of that flavor. Uh, my assistant in his um, uh, infinite wisdom, and he's a great guy, but uh, when you've been working 18 hours and you have basically doing nothing but drinking water and have no food, um, he found a Ricola lozenge in his pocket and he goes to me, hey, Stephen, he goes, look what I got. And you know, you parched kind of the way I feel about right now. And yeah, give me one of those. And we start sucking on a Ricola lozenge and um, you won't believe what happened. Um, I'm going to show you this picture and then I have a little video I'll show you. Again, if... Uh, if time permits, it's a fun one to share. But what I get to see in these pictures is the way these animals live, how they survive and they live within a habitat. And so for me, uh, conservation is not just about uh, protecting an endangered species. Uh, people will say often that, well, grizzly bears are not endangered. No, but their habitat is endangered. So it's a two-pronged approach, and that's part of what I'm trying to show in my work. This is... Um, Another image that really deals with some of the environmental issues. I wanted to go to um, uh, Iceland and I wanted to photograph the Northern Lights, but I had a very specific uh, place in mind. I wanted to go to the Blue Lagoon because here is this unique place in the world where it's wildly successful. It's probably the most popular spa in the entire world. And essentially they have created something out of wastewater, okay, that is heated by thermal uh, events. Uh, so it's water that's melted, heated by thermal vents, 
turned into hydroelectricity, and then the water that's used in the hydroelectricity process, that wastewater gets repumped into these pools, and they've created the most luxurious spa in the world. So I think it's just one of those amazing stories where they have zero carbon footprint and are insanely successful, and it is a fantastically special place. And of course, yours truly looks at all the pictures that have ever been done of this, and I see a picture where it's covered in snow, and I go, oh God, if I could only get snow, that would be amazing. Because if you have to look at it just as raw volcanic rock, it's nowhere near as exciting. And then of course, I thought about, my God, if I could get the Northern Lights, that would be amazing. And it all happened for me. It actually all happened uh, in one day, uh, we got all this. So it's uh, it's one of my new favorites. So do you come off one of these shoots with a high? I mean, you actually know you've gotten the things you wanted. So oh, yeah. are you like, I mean, like got a buzz going or something? Oh, absolutely. It's hard for me. It takes me three, four days to come down sometimes. Jeez. When I crash, it's like, get out of the way. It looks like I'm entering the Earth's atmosphere at the wrong <laughs> angle. You know, when they say the space shuttle like starts to burn, that's kind of what I look like when I start coming in. But but up until that point, I'm just like, I am. Yeah, I'm living in it. I see the image in my head. I actually see this photograph in my head already. Like, I know I have it. And then it's about trying to get it out of my head. The editing process is how I get it out of my head. And I, I, I get the tangible memory of what my day was like, what this experience was like. That's when I really sort of um, put it all together. And then we begin to really, you know, craft it and build it uh, into what my memory is. Did you go swim in there out of curiosity? Yes, I did. And I had two cocktails and I lost my glasses in the water. And I was just, let me just tell you, people think, oh, what's two drinks in, in almost 104 degree temperature? Are you kidding me? And that's salt water. And you can't see anything. Everything is like, you know, mysterious. Yeah. It's fantastic. I actually got a massage in that. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, yeah, and it's not sand that's at the bottom. I mean, it's like, no, a, no, it's man made, you know, oh, it's, yeah, it's, uh, all, it's it, you know, if you talk to the Icelanders about that, and you know, it's always funny. They go, uh, "You don't really need to go visit that place. You know, <laughs> it's like wastewater and stuff." Exactly, you know? but it it is. Uh, I got to tell you, it was fun. It was relaxing as heck. Um, I tell people, if you've had a great trip in Iceland and you want to go, you've got a couple hours to kill. Go there, chill out. Then you get on your plane. You you know you sleep the whole night. It's like perfect. So staying on this environmental theme, this was a major picture I, I recently did. So I went in uh, July uh, last year, I went to Greenland, what turned out to be the largest melt in recorded history uh, in the Greenland ice shelf. So um, uh, what I witnessed was um, really mind boggling. Um, of course, Greenland in July, the sun doesn't set. So this is a day to day picture, right? Uh, this is 36 hours. And what you're seeing here is on the left hand side, uh, you're gonna see, um, of course, these you're going to see all these whales. Uh, what I discovered about ice was that um, glacial ice is actually a living thing. There are all these microbes within the glacial ice. And I thought, you know, global warming and melting glaciers really was a story about sea level rise. But what I discovered when I made this photograph was it's actually about uh, the source of food in our oceans. Uh, when ice melts, these microbes are released into the ocean. And the plankton feast on the microbes. And guess what? The krill feed on the plankton. And then guess what happens? The whales come and they feast on the krill. And so it is a top-down food chain. Without ice into the water, there is no food for these large mammals. And what, what I realized was this was a story that I only really saw and learned about through the act of photographing. And so it's, it's, it's really been, uh, it was a, you know, a, a, a tremendous learning experience for me because, again, I, my mission with this was to show this huge narrative of the giant pieces of ice that were melting and the story almost creating a human narrative with the floating ice. Uh, but what ended up happening was I started seeing all these whales gorging and feasting, and I never saw that many whales before. And I realized that they were eating like there's no tomorrow. And the truth is, um, over the next 10 years, 20 years, we may not have glacial ice in Greenland. And so what is going to happen to our food supply? What's going to happen to the plankton, to the krill, and finally to the whales and all the other fish that survive on this top-down uh, food chain that, that, that supports 
uh, the ocean's ecosystem. And this, of course, is my book, Day to Night. And um, it's uh, uh, from Tashin, um, really over 10 years in the making. And, um, and Jeff, it was great. Thank you for sharing that wonderful thing. And uh, that video you did is fantastic. And I hope everybody gets a chance to see this in person.